the change in the value of a state function as a process takes place doesn't depend on the intricate details of the process, only on the nature of the initial and final states. And we've seen this conceptually in the climbing a mountain example. Whether I take an airplane from the top of Mount Kilimanjaro to the top of Mount Everest and record the height I'm at as I do so, or I walk down Kilimanjaro, walk over to Everest, and climb up Everest, recording my height the whole way, the overall change in height, delta h, is the same. It just is what it is, because it only depends on the state of being on top of Kilimanjaro, the initial state, and the, top, and the state of being on top of Everest, the final state. The same is true of enthalpy and state functions in chemical thermodynamics. And the basic idea that this is true is called Hess's law. We can extend and apply Hess's law in a variety of circumstances to almost any state function, really any state function in chemical thermodynamics, to gain insight into changes in state functions without ever running the processes in question. And that's the topic of this video. This slide is a formal statement of Hess's law. And what I really want to draw your attention to, first of all, is the title of the slide. Enthalpy is a state function. This entire analysis, the formal definition and applications of Hess's law, really depends on this simple notion that enthalpy depends only on the state of the system. It's a state variable, not a path of process variable. What this means is that it doesn't matter how we get from point A to point B, initial state to final state. The change in enthalpy is the same regardless. This means that if we can take a process and break it up into a series of sub-processes that overall still get us from the same initial state to the same final state, then the overall enthalpy change must be equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes of the individual steps. Think back to the climbing a mountain example. The difference in height from Kilimanjaro to Everest is equal to the sum of the differences in height when I climb down Kilimanjaro, walk to Mount Everest, and climb up Mount Everest. That's the essence of Hess's law. And so in mathematical form, say we have a reaction, R. That overall reaction can be expressed as the sum of other reactions, a series of n other reactions, R1 plus R2 plus R3, etc., all the way to Rn. Because the overall reaction can be expressed as a sum of these sort of sub-reactions, the overall enthalpy change for the reaction R is equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes for the individual sub-reactions. This is the essence of Hess's law. And what it allows us to do is deduce or calculate an unknown reaction enthalpy from reaction enthalpies that we know. And this can be quite powerful because if R is a reaction that we're going to have difficulty running or measuring, but R1 through Rn are very easy to measure or someone's already done the hard work for us, we can just do some math to calculate the enthalpy change for the reaction R without doing any experiments, which is quite nice. And we can sort of diagram the situation in the following way. Say I start at a state S1 and I end at a state S2, and let's just say the enthalpy of S2 is higher than the enthalpy of S1, I can run this process by going directly from S1 to S2, let's say, and that's associated with some overall delta H, let's call it delta H of R value. But maybe I can also get from S1 to S2 by running, oh, let's say three kind of sub-reactions or three steps that add up to the overall process. Well, since the initial state before R1 and the final state after R3 match S1 and S2 respectively, this means that the change in enthalpy for the direct route from S1 to S2 directly is equal to the sum of the delta H values of the sub-reactions R1 and R2 and R3, and we can represent that using the summation symbol as a sum from I equals one to three of delta H for each of those sub-reactions. Note the analogy to climbing the mountains here. Going down, across, and up is the same from the perspective of delta H as going directly from the initial to the final state. As a more chemical example, Let's consider the formation reaction of carbon dioxide gas. We can think of this as a one-step process where carbon and oxygen combine directly in a single step to form CO2 gas. 
Or we can think about it as a two-step process where carbon reacts with one of the oxygens in step one to form carbon monoxide. And maybe we know from previous measurements or we've measured ourselves the enthalpy associated with this process. It's exothermic by 283 kilojoules. And we can then think of the CO and we can then think of the carbon monoxide combining with another oxygen atom or another half mole of O2 to make CO2 in a second step. And we know the enthalpy change there, negative 111 kilojoules, an exothermic process again. The enthalpy change for the overall process, let's call this R and this R1 and this R2, Delta H for the overall reaction R then is equal to the sum of these two enthalpy changes. So delta H for R1 and delta H for R2, which in this case is a very simple addition problem and happens to be negative 394 kilojoules overall, where we're keeping in mind that these reactions are exothermic. We know that because the heat appears on the product side. Heat is evolved or released by these reactions. And so in adding those together, we'll end up with an exothermic process as well. This slide shows the idea in diagram form where we have the enthalpy on the y-axis and the various stages, including the initial and final state of the reaction, labeled as horizontal blue lines and the various transitions or processes labeled as red lines. So we start here at the enthalpy of the reactants. The final product is CO2 and we can imagine the direct route down in a single step. This is what we called R on the previous slide. Or we can imagine a two-step sequence that gets us from the same initial state to the same final state where we first combine with that half mole of oxygen to get to carbon monoxide and half a mole of O2 remaining. And then we combine that remaining half mole of O2 with carbon monoxide to make the final products. And so we can see, again, just like the climbing a mountain example, if I'm going from the same initial state to the same final state in both cases, I'm going to get the same overall change in enthalpy. And we can see that on the diagram evidenced by the fact that both of these curly braces are the same size. And so the enthalpy changes have the same value, whether we think about the detailed process occurring in one or two steps. A related notion to Hess's law is that if we modify a chemical reaction through scaling or reversing the chemical equation, we make the same changes or analogous changes quantitatively to the enthalpy change of the reaction. And we're going to look at two kind of quantitative rules on this slide that relate to changes we might make to chemical reactions. One thing we can do is take all the coefficients in a chemical equation and scale them all. The reaction will remain balanced. We're just looking at the reaction on a different scale in that case. And the basic rule with scaling, scaling is sort of like adding a reaction to itself a certain number of times. And so Hess's law tells us that we're going to add the enthalpy to itself that number of times or scale the change in enthalpy by that factor we're multiplying by, which essentially tells us how many times to add the, the reaction to itself, right? So multiple, multiplying a chemical equation by a factor, scaling all the coefficients by the same value, scales the delta H by that factor likewise. So here, for example, this reaction with 1 half N2 and 1 O2 combining has a delta H of positive 33.1 kilojoules. To generate the reaction below here, essentially what we've done is we've taken the entire chemical equation above and multiplied all the coefficients by 2. And we're going to do the same thing to the standard enthalpy of reaction to figure out what it is for the reaction in the bottom case. So we're going to take this number, multiply it by 2. That comes out to 66.20 kilojoules. And we found that simply by doing the same thing to the enthalpy that was done to the chemical equation multiplying by 2. That's the scaling rule in action. Now reversing, we can actually think of as scaling by negative 1, since we're turning the reactants into products and the products into reactants, in essence negating the stoichiometric coefficients. So what we can think about here 
in going from the top reaction to the bottom reaction is we're multiplying the top reaction by negative one, exchanging the reactants and products, but leaving the coefficients on each individual molecule or compound the same. The reason it's nice to think about it this way is that we make the same change to the delta H value. And so to find delta H for the second reaction, we're simply going to change the sign of delta H in the first reaction. And so delta H for the second reaction is positive 185 kilojoules. We multiplied the reaction at the top by negative one to get the bottom reaction. And so we do the exact same to find the enthalpy change of the bottom reaction. We take that enthalpy change of the top reaction and multiply by negative one. Another way to understand the reversing rule uses a kind of diagrammatic understanding. If my enthalpy change is negative 393 kilojoules in going from these reactants to these products, then clearly going in the opposite direction, I'm going to be traveling, quote unquote, the same distance upward in enthalpy, just in the opposite direction, so that the enthalpy change here is now positive 393.5 kilojoules. Just took that sign and flipped it. 